Chapters 11 and 12 of the Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 The Mind and the Body discusses the interaction between physical and mental things, and the possibility of freedom in a world of fixed causes. It is our plan, so far as possible, to discuss the problems of the mind in one section of this book, and the problems of the body in another. But just as we found that we could not separate our duties to ourself from our duties to our neighbors, so we find that the mind and the body are inextricably interwoven, and that whenever we probe deeply into one, we discover the other. The interaction of the mind and the body is a fascinating problem into which we must look for a moment, not because we expect to solve it, but because it illuminates the whole subject. The human body is a machine. It takes in carbon and oxygen, and burns them, and gives out carbon dioxide and other waste products, and develops energy in proportion to the amount of carbon it consumes. This machine has its elaborate apparatus of action and reaction, its sensory organs where outside stimuli are received, its nerves like telegraph wires to carry these impressions, its brain cells to store them and to transform them into reactions. We know to some extent how these brain cells work. We know what portions of the brain are devoted to this or that activity. We know that if we stick a pin into a certain spot, we shall paralyze the left forefinger. We know that by injecting a certain drug or by breathing a certain gas, we can cause this or that sensation or reaction, such as laughing or weeping or mania. We know what poisons are generated in the system by anger, and what chemical changes take place in a muscle that is tired. All this is a part of a vast new science which is called biochemistry, or the chemistry of life. Our bodies, therefore, are part of the material universe, and subject to the laws or ways of being of this universe. The first of these laws that we know is the law of causation. Every change in the universe has its cause, and that, in turn, had another cause. This chain is never broken, no matter how far we go, and the same causes universally produce the same effects. If you see a ball move on a billiard table, you know that the ball did not move itself. You know that something struck the ball or tilted the table you discover that the motion of the ball moves the air around it, and the waves of that motion are spread through the room. They strike the walls, and the motion is carried on through the walls, and if we had instrument sensitive enough, we could feel the motion of that billiard ball at the other side of the world, and a few million years from now, at the most remote of the stars. This is what is called the law of the conservation of energy. And when we discover something, like radium, which seems to violate that law by giving out unlimited quantities of energy, we investigate and discover a new form of energy locked up in the atom. In the disintegration of the atom, we have a source of power which, when we have learned to use it, will multiply perhaps millions of times the powers we are now able to use on this earth. But energy, no matter how many times it is transformed, and in what strange way it reappears, always remains, and is never destroyed, and never created out of nothing. My friend, the great physiologist, once took me into his laboratory and showed me a little aquarium, in which some minute creatures were wiggling about, young sea urchins, if I remember, the physiologist took a bottle containing some chemical and dropped a single drop into the water, and instantly all these little black creatures, which had been darting aimlessly in every direction through the water, turned and swam all in one direction toward the light. 
they swam until they touched the walls of the aquarium, and there they stuck, trying their best to swim farther. And now, said my friend, that is what we call a tropism. And all life is a tropism. What you see in that aquarium means that some day we shall know just what combination of chemicals causes a human being to move this way or that, to do this thing or that. When biochemistry has progressed sufficiently, we shall be able to make human qualities, perhaps in the sperm, perhaps in the embryo, perhaps day by day by means of diet or injection. Said I, some day, when biochemistry has progressed far enough, you will know what combination of chemicals causes a man to vote the Democratic or Republican ticket. Why not? answered my friend. He has a sense of humor about all things, except this sacred biochemistry. Said I, when you have got to that stage, keep the secret carefully, and we will fix up a scheme, and a few days before the election we will release some gas in our big cities and sweep the country for the socialist ticket. But, jesting aside, if the human body is a material thing, existing in the material world, and subject to causation, there must be material reasons for the actions of human bodies, just the same as for the moving of billiard balls. We hear the sound of a billiard ball striking the cushion, and we are prepared to accept the idea that the thing we call hearing in us is caused by the impinging of sound waves upon our eardrums. And if we investigate human beings in mass, we find every reason to believe that they act according to laws, and that there are material causes for their acts. If you get up and shout, fire, in a theater, you know how the audience will behave. If you study statistics, you can say that in any large city, a certain fixed number of human beings are going to commit suicide every month. You can even say that more are going to commit suicide in the month of June than in any other month. You can say that more people are going to die at two o'clock in the morning than at any other hour. You know that certain changes in the weather will cause all human beings to behave in the same way. You know that an increase of prices or an increase of unemployment will cause a certain additional number of men to commit crimes and a certain additional number of women to become prostitutes. You know that if a man overeats, his thoughts will change their color. He will have what he calls the blues. I might cite a thousand other illustrations to prove that human minds are subject to material laws, and therefore to investigation by the biochemists. But now, stop a moment. Here you sit, reading a book. Something in the book pleases you, and you say, good. Perhaps you slap your knee or clench your fist. Now here is a motion of your hand which stirs the air about you and which, according to the laws of energy, will spread its effects to the other side of the world and even to the farthest of the stars. Or perhaps the book makes you angry and you throw it down in disgust. An entirely different motion which will affect the other side of the world and the farthest of the stars in an entirely different way. The machine of the universe will be forever altered because of that slapping of your knee or that throwing down of your book. And what was the cause of these things? So far as we can see, the material cause was exactly the same in each case, the reading of certain letters. Two human beings sitting side by side and reading exactly the same letters might be affected in exactly opposite ways. It seems hardly rational to maintain that the material difference of two pairs of eyes moving over exactly the same set of letters could have resulted in two such different motions of the hands. As a matter of fact, the very same letters may affect the same person in different ways. The composer, Edward McDowell, once told me how, on his birthday, his pupil sent him a gift, with a card containing some lines from the opera Rheingold, beginning, 
O singe fort, that is, O sing on. But the composer happened, when glancing at the card, to think French instead of German, and got the message, O powerful monkey. This, of course, was disconcerting to a famous piano performer, and his pupils, if they had been watching his face, would have seen an unexpected reaction. It seems manifest, does it not, that the cause of this difference of reaction was not any difference of the letters, but purely a difference of thought. So it appears that thoughts may change the material universe. They may break the chain of causation and interfere with material events. Compare two things, a state of consciousness and, say, a steam shovel. They are entirely different, and so far as we can see, entirely incompatible and unrelated. Can anyone imagine how a thought can turn into a steam shovel, or a steam shovel into a thought? We can understand how a steam shovel lifts a mass of earth out of the ground, and we can understand how a human hand moves a lever which causes the shovel to act, but we are unable to conceive how a state of mind, whether it be a desire for pay or an ideal of service or a vision of the Panama Canal, can so affect the steam shovel as to cause it to move. We can sit and think motion at a billiard ball for a thousand years, and it does not move. But when we think motion at our hand, it moves instantly and passes on the motion to the billiard ball or the steam shovel. When a fire touches our hand, it sends some kind of vibration to the brain, and in some inconceivable way, that vibration is turned into a state of consciousness called pain. And that is turned, as quick as a thought, into another kind of motion, the jerking back of our hand. So it seems certain that consciousness really does butt in on the chain of natural causes. And yet, just see in what position this leaves the scientist who is investigating life. Imagine, if you can, the plight of a doctor who wanted to prescribe a diet for a sick person. If he knew that every piece of chicken and every fish were free to decide of its own impulse whether or not it would be digested in the human stomach. But the plight of this doctor would be nothing to the plight of the chemist or the biologist or the engineer who was asked to do his thinking and his planning in a world containing a billion and a quarter human beings, each one a lawless agent, each one a source of new and unforeseeable energies, each one acting as a first cause and starting new chains of activity, tearing the universe to pieces according to his own whims. What kind of a universe would that be? It would simply be a chaos. There could be no thinking. There could be no life in it. There could be no two things the same in it, and no laws of any sort. So then we fall back into the hands of the determinists, who assert one unbreakable chain of natural causation, and regard the human body as an automaton. We go back to the biochemist, who purposes some day to ascertain for us just exactly what molecules of matter, in just what positions and combinations in the brain cells of William Shakespeare, caused him to perpetrate a mixed metaphor. We go back to the belief that human beings act as they must act, because the clock of life, wound up and started, must move in such and such a fashion. But now, let us see what are the implications of that theory. Here am I writing a book appealing to men to act in certain ways. Of course, I know that not all will follow my advice. Some will be foolish, or what seems to me foolish. Others will be weak and will resolve to act in certain ways and then go and act in other ways. But some will be just, some will be free, some will use their brains, because, you see, I am convinced that they can use their brains. 
I am convinced that ideas will affect and stir them, in complete defiance of the biochemist, who tells me that they act that way because of certain chemicals in their brain cells, and that I write my book because of other chemicals, and that my idea that I am writing this book because I want to write it is a delusion, and that the whole thing is happening just so because the universe was wound up that way. Now, this is an unsolved problem, and I have no solution to offer. What I have set forth is, in substance, one of the four antinomies of Kant. And you can see for yourself how it is possible to prove either side, and impossible to be sure of either. Perhaps there is really a duality in life. Perhaps there are two aspects of the universe, the material and the spiritual. And perhaps they do not really interact as they seem to. But both are guided and determined by some higher reality of life of which we know nothing. In that case, there would really be a chemical equivalent for every thought, and there would be a trace of consciousness for every material atom in the universe. Maybe the theologians are right. And in the universal consciousness of God, the whole future exists predetermined. Maybe to God there is no such thing as time. The past, the present, and the future are all alike to him. There is nothing more painful to the human mind than to have to confess its own impotence. Yet I can see no escape from the dilemma which we are here facing. There is not a man alive who does not assume the freedom of the will, who does not show in all his acts that he agrees with old Dr. Samuel Johnson. We know we are free, and there's an end on't. Without a belief in freedom, we cannot get beyond the animal. We cannot become the masters of our own souls. And yet, the man who swallows that idea whole and goes out into the world and preaches personal morality to the neglect of the fundamental economic facts the facts of the body in its relationship to all other bodies? We know what happens to that man. He becomes a shouting fool. Unless he is literally a fool or a knave, he quickly discovers his own futility and proceeds to use his common sense. In spite of all his theories, Come to Jesus, cried William Booth, and he went out in the streets of London to save souls with a bass drum. But presently, in day-by-day -day contact with the degradation of the London slums, he realized that he could not save souls so long as those souls were dwelling in starved and lousy bodies. So William Booth, with his Salvation Army, took to starting night shelters and cast-off clothing bureaus. And of exactly the same sort is the bewilderment which falls to the lot of the scientist who is honest and willing to face the facts. The biochemist with his test tubes and his microscopes and his complex apparatus of research sits himself down and accumulates a mass of information about the human body. He investigates the diseases of the body and learns in detail just how these diseases spread and sometimes how they are caused. He can present you with a diagnosis showing the exact stage to which the degeneration of a certain organ has proceeded, and perhaps he can suggest to you a change of diet or some drug which will, for a time at least, check the process of the breakdown. But in other cases, he will be perfectly helpless. He will be, as it were, buried under the mass of detail which he has accumulated he will find the vital energy depressed, and he will not know any way to renew it. But along will come some mental specialist who, in a half hour's talk with the patient, by a simple change in the patient's ideas, will completely make over the patient's life and set going a new vital process which will restore the body to its former health. A religious enthusiast may do this. A psychotherapist may do it. A moral genius may do it, and the physician, with all his learning, 
will find himself like a man on the outside of a house peering in through the windows and trying in vain to find out something about the life of the family and its guests. This is humiliating to the chemist and the medical man. But they have to face it, because it is a fact. In the seat of authority over the human body there sits a higher being, which, without any religious implications, we may call the soul. Or, if it is impossible to get away from the religious implication of that word, we will call it the consciousness, or the personality. This master of the house of life is in many ways dependent upon the house. If the furnace goes out, he freezes. And if the house takes fire and burns up, well, he disappears and leaves no address. But in other ways, the master of the house is really master, and is a worker of miracles. He does things which we do not at all understand and cannot yet even foresee, but which often completely makes the house over. William James, a scientist of real authority, has a wonderful essay, The Powers of Men, in which he sets forth the fact that human beings, as a general rule, make use of only a small portion of their energies which dwell in their beings, and that one of our problems is to find out the ways by which we can draw upon stores of hidden energy which we have within us. Also, in a fascinating book, Varieties of the Religious Experience, James has endeavored to study and analyze the phenomena which hitherto the physician and the biologist have been disposed to ridicule and neglect. But unless I am mistaken, every scientist in the end will be forced to come back to the central fact that life is a unity, and that the heart of it is the spirit, that what we call the will is not an accident not a delusion, not some byproduct of nature, but is the very secret of life, and that behind it is a vast ocean of power, which now and then sweeps away all dikes and floods into the human consciousness. The writer of this book is now a patient and plodding teacher of a certain economic doctrine, a preacher of what he might call anti-parasitism, he has come to the conclusion that the habit of men to enslave their fellows and exploit them and draw their substance from them without return, that this habit is destructive to all civilization and is incompatible with any of the higher forms of life, intellectual, moral, or artistic. He has come to the conclusion that there is no use attempting to build a structure of social life until there is a sound foundation. In other words, until the capitalist system has been replaced by cooperation. But in his youth he was, or thought he was, a poet, and touched upon that strange and wonderful thing which we call genius. He saw his own consciousness, as it were a leaf driven before a mighty tempest of spiritual energy, and he believes that this experience was no delusion, but was a revelation of the hidden mysteries of his being. He still has memories of this startling experience, still hints of it in his consciousness. Something still leaps in his memory like a racehorse, or like the war horse of Revelation, which senteth the battle afar off, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. Because of these things, he can never accept any philosophy which shackles the human spirit. He will never in his thought attempt to set bounds to the possibilities of human life. The very heart of life beats in us. The wonder of it and the glory of it swells like a tide behind us. New universes are born in us. Or, if you prefer, they are made by us. And the process is one of endless joy, of rapture beyond anything that the average man can at present imagine or that any instruments invented by science can weigh or measure. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 The Mind of the Body Discusses the subconscious mind, 
what it is, what it does to the body, and how it can be controlled and made use of by the intelligence. The importance of the mind in matters of health becomes clearer when we understand that what we commonly call our minds, the mental states which confront us day by day in our consciousness, are really but a small portion of our total mind. In addition to this conscious mind, there is an enormous mass of our personality which is like a storehouse attached to our dwelling, a place to which we do not often go, but to which we can go in case of need. This storehouse is our memory, the things we know and can recall at will. And then there is another, still vaster storehouse, no one has ever measured or guessed the size of it, which apparently contains everything that we have ever known, perhaps also everything that our ancestors have known. A common simile for the human mind is that of an iceberg. A certain portion of it appears above the surface of the sea, but there is seven times as much of it floating out of sight under the water. This subconscious mind seems to be the portion most closely united with the body. It has its seat in the back parts of the brain, in the spinal cord and the greater nervous ganglia, such as the solar plexus. It is the portion of our mind which controls the activities of our body, all those miraculous things which went on before we first opened our eyes to the light, and which go on while we sleep, and never cease until we die. When we cut our finger and admit foreign germs to our blood, some mysterious power causes millions of our blood corpuscles to be rushed to this spot to destroy and devour the invading enemy. We do not know how this is done, but it is an intelligent act, measured and precisely regulated, as much so as a railroad timetable. When the supply of nourishment in the body becomes low, something issues a notice by way of our stomach which we call hunger. When we take food into the stomach, something pours out the gastric juice to digest it. When this digested food is prepared and taken up in the bloodstream, something decides what portion of it shall be turned into muscle, what into brain cells, what into hair, what into fingernails. Sometimes, of course, mistakes are made, and we have diseases. But for the most part, all this infinitely intricate process goes on day and night without a hitch, and it is all the work of what we might call the mind of the body. And just as our material bodies are the product of an age-long process of development repeated in embryo by every individual, so is this mental life a product of long development, and carries memories of this far-off process. In our instincts there dwells all the past, not merely of the human race, but of all life. And if we should ever succeed in completely probing the subconscious mind and bringing it into our consciousness, it would be the same as if we were free to ramble about in all the past. Huxley set forth the fact that all the history of evolution is told in a piece of chalk. And we probably do not exaggerate in saying that all the history of the universe is in the subconscious mind of every human being. When the partridge which has just come out of the egg sees the shadow of a hawk flit by and crouches motionless as a leaf, the partridge is not acting upon any knowledge which it has acquired in the few minutes since it was hatched. It is acting upon a knowledge impressed upon its subconscious mind by the experience of millions of partridges, perhaps for tens of thousands of years. When the physician lifts the newly born infant by its ankle and spanks it to make it cry, the physician is using his conscious reason, because he has learned from previous experience, or has been taught in the schools, that it is necessary for the child's breathing apparatus to be instantly cleared. But when the child responds to the spanking with a yell, it is not moved by reason indignation at an undeserved injury. It is following an automatic reaction, as a result of the experience of infants in the Stone Age, experience which in some obscure way has been registered and stored 
in the infant cerebellum. Science is now groping its way through this underworld of thought. Obviously, we should have here a most powerful means of influencing the body, if by any chance we could control it. We are continually seeking in medical and surgical ways to stimulate or to retard activities of the body, which are controlled entirely by the subconscious mind. If we are suffering intense pain in a joint, we put on a mustard plaster, what we call a counter-irritant, to trouble the skin and draw the congested blood away from the place of the pain. On the other hand, we may stimulate the functions of the intestines by the application of hot fomentations, to bring the blood more actively to the region. But if by any means we could make clear our wishes to the subconscious mind, we should be dealing with headquarters, and should get quicker and more permanent results. Can we by any possibility do this? To begin with, let me tell you of a simple experiment that I have witnessed. I once knew a man who had learned to control the circulation of his blood by his conscious will. I have seen him lay his two hands on the table, both of the same color, and without moving the hands, cause one hand to turn red and the other to turn pale. And obviously, so far as this man is concerned, the problem of counter-irritants has been solved. He is a mental mustard plaster. And what was done by this man's own will can be done to others in many ways. The most obvious is a device which we call hypnotism. This is a kind of sleep which affects only the conscious control of the body, but leaves all the senses awake. In this hypnotic sleep, or trance, we discover that the subconscious mind is a good deal like the Henry Dubb of the socialist cartoons. It is faithful and persistent, very strong in its own limited field, but comically credulous, willing to believe anything that is told it, and to take orders from anyone who climbs into the seat of authority. You have perhaps attended one of the exhibitions which traveling hypnotists are accustomed to give in country villages. You have seen some bumpkin brought upon the stage and hypnotized, and told that he is in the water and must swim for his life, or that he is in the midst of a hornet's nest, or that his trousers are torn in this seat, any comical thing that will cause an audience to howl with laughter. These facts were first discovered nearly a 150 years ago by a French doctor named Mesmer. He was a good deal of a charlatan, and would not reveal his secrets, and probably the scientific men of that time were glad to despise him, because what he did was so new and strange. There is a certain type of scientific mind which sits aloft on a throne with a framed diploma above its head, and says that what it knows is science, and what it does not know is nonsense. And so mesmerism was left for the quacks and the traveling showmen. But half a century later, a French physician named Libo took up this method of hypnotism without all the fakery that had been attached to it. He experimented and discovered that he could cure not merely phobias and manias, fixed ideas, hysterias, and melancholias, he could cure definite physical diseases of the physical body, such as headache, rheumatism, and hemorrhage. Later on, two other physicians, Janet and Charcot, developed definite schools of psychotherapy. They rejected hypnotism as in most cases too dangerous, but used a milder form, which is known as hypnoidization. You would be surprised to know how many ailments which baffle the skill of medical men and surgeons yield completely to a single brief treatment by such a mental specialist. All that is necessary is some method to tap the subconscious mind. In many cases, the subconsciousness knows what is the matter and will tell at once a secret that is completely hidden from the consciousness. For example, a man's hands shake. They have been shaking for years, and he has no idea why. But his subconscious mind explains that they first began to shake with grief over the death of his wife, also, the subconscious mind meekly and instantly accepts the suggestion 
that the time for grief is past, and that the hands will never shake again. Or here is a woman who has become convinced that worms are crawling all over her. Everything that touches her becomes a worm. Even the wrinkles in her dress are worms. And she is wild with nervousness, and of course is on the way to the lunatic asylum. She is hypnotized, and sees the operator catching these worms one by one and killing them. She is told that he has killed the last. But she insists, no, there's one more. The operator clutches that one, and she is perfectly satisfied and completely cured. Her husband writes, expressing his relief that he no longer has to sleep every night in a fish pond. This instance, with many others, is told by Professor Quackenboss in his book, Hypnotic Therapeutics. Among the most powerful means to influence the subconscious personality is religious excitement. Religion has come down to us from ancient times, and its fears and ecstasies are a part of our instinctive endowment. Those who can sway religious emotions can cure disease, not merely fixed ideas, but many diseases which appear to be entirely physical, but which psychoanalysis reveals to be hysterical in nature. Of course, these religious persons who heal by laying on of hands or by purely mental means deny indignantly that they are using hypnotism or anything like it. I am aware that I shall bring upon myself a flood of letters from Christian scientists if I identify their methods of curing with animal magnetism and manipulation and other devices of the devil which they repudiate. All I can say is that their miracles are brought about by affecting the subconscious mind. There is no other way to bring them about, and for my part, I cannot see that it makes a great difference whether the subconscious mind is affected by a hand laid on the forehead, or by a hand waved in the air, or by an incantation pronounced, or by a prayer thought in silence. If you can persuade the subconscious mind that God is operating upon it, that God is omnipotent and is directing this particular healing, that is the most powerful suggestion imaginable, and is the basis of many cures. But if in order to achieve this, it is necessary for me to persuade myself that I can find some meaning in the metaphysical moonshine of Mother Eddy, why, then, I am very sorry, but I really prefer to remain sick. But such is not the case. You do not have to believe anything that is not true. You simply have to understand the machinery of the subconscious and how to operate it. We are only beginning to acquire that knowledge, and we need an open mind, free both from dogmatism of the medical men and the fanaticism of the faith curists. A few years ago in London, I met a number of people who were experimenting in an entirely open-minded way with mental healing and I was interested in their ideas. I happened to be traveling on the continent, and on the train my wife was seized by a very dreadful headache. She was lying with her head in my lap, suffering acutely, and I thought I would try an experiment. So I put my hand upon her forehead without telling her what I was doing, and concentrated my attention with the greatest possible intensity upon her headache. I had an idea of the cause of it, I understood that headaches are caused by the irritation of the sensory nerves of the brain by fatigue poisons or other waste matter which the blood has not been able to eliminate. I formed in my mind a vivid picture of what the blood would have to do to relieve that headache, and I concentrated my mental energies upon the command to her subconscious mind that it should perform these particular functions. In a few minutes, my wife sat up with a look of great surprise on her face and said, Why, my headache is gone. It went all at once. That, of course, might have been a coincidence. But I tried the experiment many times, and it happened over and over. On another occasion, I was able to cure the pain of an ulcerated tooth. I was able to cure it half a dozen times, but never permanently. It always returned, and finally the tooth had to come out. My wife experimented with me in the same way, and found that she was able to cure an attack of dyspepsia. But, curiously enough, 
she at once gave herself a case of dyspepsia, something she had never known in her life before. So now I will not allow her to experiment with me, and she will not allow me to experiment with her. But we are quite sure that people with psychic gifts can definitely affect the subconscious mind of others by purely mental means. We are prepared to believe in the miracles of the New Testament and in the wonders of Lourdes, as well as in the healings of the Christian scientists and new thoughters, which cannot be disputed by anyone who is willing to take the trouble to investigate. We can face these facts without losing our reason, without ceasing to believe that everything in life has a cause, and that we can find out this cause if we investigate thoroughly. End of chapter 12